Random House Audio presents John by Cynthia Lennon. Read for you by the author. Growing up as John Lennon's son has been a rocky path. All my life I've had people coming up to me saying, I loved your dad. I always have very mixed feelings when I hear this. I know that dad was an idol to millions who grew up loving his music and his ideals. But to me, he wasn't a musician or a peace icon. He was the father I loved and who let me down in so many ways. After the age of five, when my parents separated, I saw him only a handful of times, and when I did, he was often remote and intimidating. I grew up longing for more contact with him, but felt rejected and unimportant in his life. Dad was a great talent, a remarkable man who stood for peace and love in the world, but at the same time he found it very hard to show any peace and love to his first family, my mother and me. In many accounts of Dad's life, we are either dismissed or at best treated as insignificant bit players in his life, which sadly is something that continues to this day. Yet Mum was his first real love and she was with him for half his adult life, from art college to the genesis of the Beatles to their overwhelming worldwide success. That's why I'm so happy that she's decided to write her side of the story. For far too long now, Mum has put up with being relegated to a puff of smoke in Dad's life, and that simply is not the truth. Now it's time to set the record straight. There's so much that has never been said, so many tales that have never been told. If there is to be a balanced picture of Dad's life, then Mum's side of the story is long overdue. I'm immensely proud of her. She's always been there for me. She was the one who kept it all together, taught me what matters in life, and stayed strong when our world was crumbling. While Dad was fast becoming one of the wealthiest men in his field, Mum and I had very little, and she was going out to work to support us. Mum has always acted with dignity, and I have her to thank for who I am. I love her honesty, and her courage, and I know it's taken a great deal of both for her to write her story. That's why I offer her my full support and recommend this book to anyone who wants to know the truth, the real truth, about Dad's life. For ten years I shared my life with a man who was a huge figure in his lifetime, and who has become a legend since his death. Through the years in which the Beatles came together and went on to delight and astound the world, I was with him, sharing the highs and lows of his public and private lives. Since John's death, I've watched shelves full of books come and go, most by people who never knew him and who painted a one-sided, flawed picture of him and our relationship. Many consigned me to a brief walk-on part in John's life, notable only because we had a son. I was usually dismissed as the impressionable young girl who fell for him, then trapped him into marriage. That was a long way from the truth. I was at John's side throughout the most exciting, extraordinary and eventful ten years of his life. It was a time when he was at his creative best. A time when he was witty, passionate, honest and open. When he loved his family and loved the Beatles. The time before drugs and fame led him toward the destruction of so much that he had valued. 
After my marriage to John fell apart, I tried to escape the world of celebrity and the Lennon label by going off to find my own life. I wanted security for our son and a life that was real and purposeful, out of the limelight. Both my privacy and my dignity were important to me, so I preferred to let others do the talking. Now the time has come when I feel ready to tell the truth about John and me, our years together and the years since his death. There is so much that I have never said, so many incidents I have never spoken of, and so many feelings I have never expressed. Great love on one hand, pain, torment, and humiliation on the other. Only I know what really happened between us, why we stayed together, why we parted, and the price I paid for having been John's wife. The late fifties was a wonderful time to be young and setting out in the world. The grim days of the war and post-war deprivation were over. National service had been lifted and teenagers were allowed to be youthful and unafraid. It was as though the grey austerity of the forties had been replaced by a brilliant spectrum of opportunities and possibilities. Britain was celebrating survival and freedom and the time was ripe for dreams, hopes, and creativity. I started at Liverpool College of Art in September 1957. I had just turned 18 and could hardly believe my luck. A year earlier, my father had died after a painful battle with lung cancer. My two older brothers had left home and my mother and I had little money. Before he died, Dad, who was desperately worried about providing for us, told me that I wouldn't be able to go to college. I'd have to get a job and help Mum. I promised I would, but it was hard to accept that my college hopes were at an end. Mum said nothing at the time, but she knew how much college meant to me, and after Dad's death, she said, You go to college, love. We'll manage somehow. She took in lodgers to make ends meet. <laughs> 